Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie, and I am the Outreach Librarian for the NOAA Central Library, who is helping to host and sponsor with this with the NOAA uh, Technology Partnerships Office. A few logistics to begin. You are muted, and this uh, presentation is being recorded. So if you do have a question, please place that in the question panel, and it will be asked at the end of our presentation. Um, and since it is being recorded, any questions you ask, ask and your email addresses will also be recorded. And, and if we don't get to your question, we will pass those on to our speaker to answer individually offline. And I just want to uh, let everyone know if you are having a technical issue, such as you can't see the screen or you can't hear the presentation, try logging off and logging back on. That solves most issues with GoToWebinar. Uh, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Tiffany House, who is going to introduce our speaker today for the NOAA Innovator Series. Thank you, Katie. Welcome, everyone. My name is Tiffany House again. I am the commercialization specialist of the NOAA Small Business Innovation Research Program. Welcome to the NOAA Innovative Series featured presentation. This is actually the last one in for a while, so uh, welcome and enjoy. <laughs> this series features innovators who have developed innovative products and services that advance NOAA's mission. Speakers include NOAA scientists and engineers, as well as entrepreneurs who have participated in NOAA's SBIR program. Inventors highlight novel features and potential commercial applications of their inventions and share insights on their experiences transforming creative ideas into technologies that solve real world problems. Robonautica completed an SBIR phase two contract this summer. The technology is still in development, but is anticipated to be released next fall of 2022. During Ed's 13 years at iRobot Corporation's research and military and industrial robotics division, he helped build robots that have gone inside an inaccessible shaft in the Great Egypt, in the Great Pyramid in Egypt, traveled 10 kilometers down a live oil well in Scotland, disarmed thousands of IEDs in Iraq and Afghanistan and more. After iRobot, Ed designed a development system for underwater robots vehicles, then launched Robonautica to commercialize DSERV. Ed used it to build a proof of concept reef rover whose successful sea trials at Gray's Reef led to Robonautica's SBIR contract to develop the SBIR Reef Rover to a near commercialization ready prototype. And if you are not sure or haven't been informed, but now we are moved to grants versus contracts. It was part of our SBIR companies that had a contract with NOAA. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ed Williams. Well, thank you, Tiffany. Uh, um... Thank you all for joining me today. I know this is your lunchtime and uh, it's valuable time and, and I, I appreciate all of your uh, your attention for a while. Um, let me first say, A, I'm not a great public speaker and this is my first PowerPoint uh, presentation. So we'll, we'll, we'll ride through the rough spots on that. Uh, this is also gonna be short since we have 20 minutes and um, so I'm gonna kind of blast through everything, and but I will be more than happy to, to talk to anybody at whatever length you desire about uh, any of the, of the technical issues behind, uh, behind, the, behind this product. Um, so the, the, the product is uh, the, you know, the, the B Rover, the Benthic Environmental ROV Extensible ro Robot, because I was told that uh, the NOAA loves uh, acronyms. Um, but the project started um, back in 2013 uh, after a visit to Gray's Reef as a volunteer. Um, and I happened to meet a gentleman uh, named Todd Resikar, and who is a NOAA captain and a NOAA vessel captain and a um, um, uh, and also a research diver. And since NOAA has been my heroes for a long time, I asked him. Uh, what could we make, what could roboticists make that would just make your life easier, just to make it so that 
your vital mission is uh, is a little bit easier to do. And he informed me that um, what he would would make their life easier is if they had what he called a um, a, a Mars rover for their coral reef. And uh, let's take a quick look at um, at at Gray's Reef. Here's the environment at Gray's Reef. It's about 70 feet down in the water. Uh, open sandy areas uh, mixed with live coral. Uh, it's deep, it's fairly cold, and if you notice there, you'll see a very stiff current blowing through there. So it's a tough, challenging scuba environment uh, to do research in by, by strapping on a tank and going down all the time. Um, so the, I, you know, so, you know the, the idea was to see how we could augment scuba-based research and surveys and uh, keep the divers safer. Uh, and just make it a little easier for them. Um, since it's, uh, you know, one of the problems with it is that it's, since it's an hour and a half, you get about an hour to an hour and a half of diving at 70 feet, just because of decompression rules. So after you spending basically all day getting out to Grace Reef, because it's 16 miles offshore off the coast of Savannah, Georgia, you get about an hour and a half of active diving before you've got to come back again, which is not a lot of, of, of time out there. It's a cold, hard, fatiguing dive day after day. Uh, those, those, those divers are some of the sharpest, hardest divers I've ever seen. Um, one of the other problems is the diver presence when they're down there with cameras and, and tools to, to, um, to observe uh, the behaviors of the organisms. Their, their very presence, their, their bubbles, their noise, their size affects the, the organisms they're trying to, to, whose behaviors they're trying to capture. Uh, another problem has always been that there's no night diving there for uh, a bunch of rules, uh, one of which is, is you know, bull and tiger sharks at the area. Um, and so because of that, there's been no long persistence uh, capability of following an organism for, say, 24 hours just to see what's the life cycle over 24 hours of, of this coral or this sea star or this octopus. Um, and of course, if you're not a NOAA-certified certified, a NOAA certified scientific diver, you can't go down there at all. So you just don't have access to it. So we were just wondering, what can we do to, to make their lives easier and, 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 and augment that? Now they've tried using commercial ROVs for that, but to do, um, you know, there's, there's a couple problems with that. It, it, the, the ROV is tethered to a boat. Um, so you have to station keep the boat over the ROV in order to just to, to, to avoid dragging it around. That means you've got to burn power uh, with your boat. That means somebody else has to drive the boat while there's somebody else uh, uh, driving the ROV. That's two people instead of one. Um, you know, and, and to try and photo uh, to take macro photography with a free swimming ROV floating around in current while you're floating around on the surface is difficult and fatiguing. Um, you know, there's a uh, also there's a high cost of commercial ROVs and, and maintenance. And, uh, you know, it's hard to upgrade them. Uh, you know, once you've got it, you've, you're kind of stuck with that technology. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to show you uh, Todd Resikar's original drawing uh, for this. Uh, he hates this drawing, but uh, I love it because it, it's, it's very, very clear and shows exactly what he wanted. Um, and if you see, I don't, I don't know if you, I hope you can see my mouse, um, but the structure of, of Gray's Reef is sand flats like you have down here and then ledges with live corals on them. But there's always these edges where a lot of really interesting organisms live. Um, so if you had an ROV that, could, that was on the bottom rolling around so that it could be a stable video platform to, to, to do close up videography from, that would be a good thing. Um, and his uh, original conception of it was it's tethered via something to the surface to a radio that's that uh, has just a pure you know Wi-Fi link off to the boat. So the boat doesn't have to be tethered. You can put the robot in the water, drive up current for a distance, and and just play with the robot until you happen to drift back down current, and then do it again for as long as you want it. Uh, it was a it was a good clear uh, clean sort of problem. Um, so what we initially came up with just as sort of first steps was a concept like this. Uh, I had already built a bunch of underwater um, components for quickly, you know, building um, under, you know, pressure vessels, uh, housings for electronics, uh, ways to connect those together. 
And so I used that system uh, to um, just to make come up with a quick uh, initial proof of concept design. And so we got a rover on the bottom with with tank tracks. Uh, it's connected via an Ethernet to the surface. A Wi-Fi transceiver here goes back to the boat. You've got a camera on an arm so that uh, since this is a nice big stable platform, you can precisely put that camera down if you want to photograph corals or, or animals that are that are very small and difficult to to, to photograph. Uh, uh, if you if you were trying to to do that with a with an ROV, um, also this could stay on the bottom for as long as you wanted. It. it doesn't have to come back up uh, at the end of a dive. Uh, the final design that we came up with uh, as of uh, the end of phase two. Um, just recently is this. Uh, it is a rover with brushless DC motors driving its tractor, an arm that, uh oh, sorry about that, an arm that sticks out uh, uh, 50, uh, 50 centimeters that'll put the camera out in front and, and down and around the, the, the rover, uh, can swing most of the way around uh, in, in, I'd say, about 270 degrees of travel. It's got a pan tilt here for the camera. It's got a Sony, uh, just a Sony camcorder, the kind you can buy at Best Buy anywhere because uh, I'll explain for some reasons, it has a phenomenally good lens and camera system for doing what we're, what we're gonna be doing with this. Um, and it came to fruition uh, in this form. And so we have uh, our camera system here we have a buoy that has uh, two boxes on it. The boxes contain batteries and a, an Ethernet tether down to the bottom. And this is basically a power over Ethernet situation. There's 100, uh, there's 100 volts of batteries in that box, and it brings 100 volts down to the rover. The rover uh, converts that into 12 volts to run all of its electronics. The other box is a box with the Wi Fi controls so that it's um, you know, it, it is itself sort of a robot. You, the, the, the user on the boat can talk to it and use it to shut off the, the, the rover uh, with, a, with a relay. It's got a GPS receiver and an Iridium satellite link so that you can not only know the, the GPS, GPS location of the rover, but um, you know, when we're through developing it, you'll be able to send messages basically to any, any place on the planet via Iridium. Not, not video, just simple messages, 256 byte limit, but still enough to send a message saying, hey, uh, come back to shore, there's a storm coming. Um, the operator control unit for this is just a standard PC of basically any type. Uh, it can be Windows or, 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 uh, or Linux. Uh, all you need is a laptop or a PC and a gamepad. And it can be a Logitech gamepad like this one or a Windows gamepad or a, or a Microsoft gamepad or uh, whatever you want. Um, there's just a Python uh, computer language program running here that intercepts the commands from the joystick and keyboard and sends those down via TCP IP, uh, I'm sorry, via, um, uh, via uh, IP uh, datagrams down to the rover and it receives uh, Ethernet packets of video back up, the, um, back up that same channel. Um, and so you get your video display and it's transmitting uh, the, your commands from either the keyboard or the keypad down to the rover. Um, this is again, what it was basically finally looking like um, as of uh, May, uh, May of this year. Uh, we're still doing some work on it, uh, but um, it is, uh, we, we anticipate it's gonna be ready to go uh, back to Grace Reef for some some more testing, uh, you know, over the summer or this autumn, whenever they 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 call upon us to do that. Um, it's a basic picture of just the 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 arm itself, um, and we'll we'll get to that later. Sorry. Uh, so what's this rover? It's a Mars rover for our coral reef, uh, and that's what uh, what Captain Todd Rescar called it back in 2014. So it's a bottom crawling mobile robotics platform for supplying 1080p video on a robotic arm with full wide angle to, to very, very, very good macro uh, photo photographic control. It has uh, user, instrument, uh, user instrument interfaces on it. It's got ethernet exposed, uh, RS-232, USB. So if you have other instruments like 
uh, a CGD uh, uh, conductivity uh, temperature depth sensor. Uh, you can and it, and it talks RS-232 serial. You can plug that in, and we can write, help you write up some code to have that displayed on the surface as well. Um, it's right now we've tested it to 60 meters of operating depth, but uh, the components uh, I've been testing to to 100 meters and expect uh, to to get that. Um, so its capabilities and features, uh, 1080p video, as I said, 300 millisecond latency, which is almost instantaneous, very, very low latency, very good. Uh, you, you can track the animals pretty much in real time. Ethernet two-way communications, uh, adaptable interfaces for 12 volt power. So if you have another instrument you want to put down on there, you can not only get USB or RS-232 or Ethernet, you can pull 12 volt power uh, from the rover to, to do so. Um, it uses an extensive, it, it extensively uses COTS components just to capitalize on existing technologies and lower cost. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the drive components are uh, standard uh, brushless DC motors that are, uh, that used to be very expensive, but now are dirt cheap because, uh, because of, the, of the aerial drone revolution. Uh, so a motor that used to be $100 when, before I started this, pro, this project, are $15 motors now, and they are going to do nothing but get better and more efficient and cheaper because uh, the, R, the ROV, the, the aerial drone market is going to be driving that forward. Um, all of the software is going to be completely open source to NOAA. It's just Python, it's just Arduino, and uh, a little bit of, of uh, C++ code. Um, it will have a full set of electrical schematics for all the circuit boards mechanical uh, CAD package, uh, SolidWorks is the mechanical CAD package I use, though NOAA will get a full set of, of, the, of the mechanicals uh, so that it'll be easy for them to customize and develop and you can give it a, you break apart, you can hand it to a machinist on, on, on a ship at sea at, at their machine shop like the larger NOAA vessels have and make a new part. You don't have to call Ed Williams up and wake me up and, and try and get you a part. Um, so what uh, so what else can this thing do for for divers? So the the battery, as I said, is is on the uh, on that buoy on the surface. So now the battery is swappable, so that once you run out of batteries, you can swap that battery out, hot swap it, and uh, without shutting down the rover. So that if you happen to be following some animal uh, across the seafloor, um, you can continue to follow him through however many however however long you want to stay in that in that boat. Uh, no more diver fatigue, decompression issues, or safety issues. Um, and an important thing is that the rovers demonstrated a minimal effect on the fish behaviors. They either ignore it or swim up to it because they're curious, but it's not, they don't perceive it as a threat, uh, which makes uh, uh, observation a lot easier. Um, you know, so this will, will give you a multiple, you know, order of magnitude increase in the amount of bottom time research and observation you get per boat trip. Uh, you know, instead of just getting an hour and a half, you know, uh, an, an hour dive at, at 70 feet, a long surface interval, and then another half, half hour dive after that. Uh, and as I said, it's easy to interface uh, other instruments to it because because the, you know, the standard electrical ports, Ethernet, USB, uh, RS-232, et cetera, can be, will be exposed. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. So, what are our, our, our specs and requirements for this thing? You know, Todd wanted it to be a one-person deployable system. So, he wanted it under 18 kilograms, under 40 pounds. Uh, you know, hopefully to go down to, to 200 feet, 60 meters. Uh, but we think that you know it, it will be adaptable to depths you know greater than 200 meters. Not this robot, but it's modular enough where we can build other pressure vessels and so forth to and use other connectors to do that. Untethered to the surface, um, you know, we were hoping initially for about you know, 100 meters or so of, of standoff, so that uh, the, you don't have to you don't have to keep the boat right over the ROV. And on our first try, we found out we got 1.5 kilometers, which was amazing. Nobody could tell us that when I asked, uh, uh, you know, Wi-Fi experts or radio experts. We just tried it, and it just worked way past our expectations, so we stopped. Um, you know, it's low cost. Our target practice, our target price for uh, for NOAA is going to be under fourteen thousand dollars, and and can be less than that depending on what what uh, how how it's set up. Um, and the the camera controls you get are 
the same camera controls you get if you had that camcorder in your hand and you were working the menu. You can do record stop, wide angle, autofocus, go down into the into the camera menu just by using your your arrow keys and enter on your keyboard and all that gets translated down to the camera via a serial communications protocol that that uh, proprietary sony communications protocol called lank l-a-n-c that uh, allows you to to remotely control the camera you can go into the menu change the time the date uh upload video uh anything you want to do um, any laptop with a standard gamepad, Windows or Linux. Uh, so why the Sony camera? Uh, first of all, they're, they're very low cost. We initially started out hoping to do, or with, with we were exploring uh, the, the folks at Gray's Reef, two favorite cameras, which were GoPros and, a, and the Canon 5D system. So uh, the Canon 5D system is a full-blown $5,000 beautiful camera that they use in 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 housings uh, to go diving with, um, but there are a couple of problems. If you want to have a, a robot that only weighs 40 pounds, um, you can't have a camera in a housing that you need 40 pounds of, of weight just to hold that 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 housing down. Uh, so the auto the, so the Canon 5D had problems just with that, just with the size and bulk of that camera in a in a commercial uh, uh, housing. Uh, the other thing that it had a problem with is that it gets fooled by particulate matter between you and between the camera lens and the subject. Uh, that was uh, a, one of the one of Todd's initial requests is that we be able to put this camera into manual focus because uh, if if they're trying to photograph a fish three feet away and there's particles in the water two feet away, the Canon tends to think that you want to look at the particles because it's there in front of it and it's moving. Uh, the Sony doesn't get fooled by that for some reason. Just their their algorithm is different. Uh, it just simply works better in that respect. Um, the other uh, thing about the the GoPro GoPro is a wonderful camera, but it had two problems for us. You can't you at the time. Now this has been fixed subsequently in GoPro tens, but at the time you couldn't put a a if you put a GoPro down and you you could stream video through it, but you couldn't do so without recording. So as you were using it to to just see where the robot was going, you were burning up your recording time. That was bad. Um, you know, the light controls being able to get full control over the uh, uh, over the the microcontroller um, and the and the small form factor made it made it just a, a great tool for us. And it also has an amazing lens. This it's got a Carl Zeiss lens on it. And this image of a standard scent is a raw image. This isn't blown up from an image. This is what you would get. It would fill the screen with a Lincoln headset. Um, you know, it's it's just an incredible lens, uh, and of course you get full wide angle and regular, you know, uh, normal zoom viewing. But uh, its minimum focus distance is 36 millimeters, so you can walk right up to something like this and get beautiful photographs of, you know, one coral polyp and not the coral polyp that's sitting next to that coral polyp. Uh, here's a quick you know, look at the quality of video you get. Uh, it wasn't just for stills, but um, when you're zooming in and out uh, with that camera, if you're close enough, you can get just incredibly sharp video. Uh, it's just a beautiful lens. And it's, you know, and again, it's a $300, you know, cheapy from Best Buy. Um, let's see, I'm gonna blast through that. Uh, so what do we want the rover to accomplish? So, the, you know, you know the, the, the NOAA folks wanted to be able to, Put this robot on the bottom and do time series photo mosaics of the reef over long periods of time, do time lapse photography, macro photography, which at which it will, I, I think it will excel, uh, ledge surveys and mapping, wildlife observations without the noise of scuba and, and diversion, uh, night surveys where you know they they just haven't done um, you know observed uh, nocturnal animals on on the reef, and of course everything changes uh, a completely different cast of characters at night on any in in any ocean environment and also be able to add onboard data logging uh, with acoustics uh, water quality sensors etc that uh, we can help them just interface right into this into the system um, so what did we do what what's happened so far um, this is Todd Resikar himself uh, with our very first prototype rover. This is before we had an SBIR. I just was was just working with him and just seeing 
hey, let's see if we can develop this tool. Uh, so back in 2014, we did a proof of, proof of concept rover, uh, took it from my office in California at Robonautica out there, took it out on the boat, put it in the water and uh, got some, some really good results with it. Um, here is some video that we actually took on our first dive with it. And you'll see a beautiful shark come swimming up there. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there he goes. Um, and that's the, that's the, you know, the, the, unfortunately it's very green, but this is just natural light shooting on Gray's Reef. We weren't trying to get beautiful shots. We were just trying to see, does the camera just basically work? Does this concept, you know, is there something that we haven't anticipated that makes it so we just simply can't do this for some reasons we, we can't anticipate. During our second deployment, we had a little problem. Uh, this is, you know, it's it's a rough game being underwater. So uh, I was a little sleep deprived, didn't screw a connector down, and on our second dive, flooded the entire electronics package. End of mission. Uh, that's uh, that's just how it goes sometimes. Uh, you, you you live with those and you try and chuckle about it. I have all those parts on my on my wall as kind of you know my favorite trophies. But despite that, uh, despite the flooded pressure vessel, the concept was validated. We got really good performance data out of it, um, we, it which, which drove future changes that we decided to make. We decided to go ahead with plans for a Rover 2 with improved chassis design to manage our weight better. Um, one of the problems we have, one well, of the potential problems we have, is we have that long tether to the surface in a buoy. The Rover's got to be, while it's still got to be light enough for one person to carry, we want it has to be heavy enough so that the current can't drag the buoy and the tether and drag the robot all over the place. So um, we decided to go away and improve the chassis with a much heavier, uh, much denser chassis than the plastic one we'd had in that, that first one, which was great to knock together. Um, and while we're doing that, uh, Sarah Fangman, who was the at that time the assistant uh, superintendent at Gray's Reef, made Todd aware that uh, NOAA does SBIRs. And so we had a, a possible source of funding on this. Now at iRobot, I'd done, iRobot cut its teeth on SBIRs. I mean, when I joined iRobot, there were 23 people. I think I was employee number 23 and all we did was SBIRs uh, for, for, you know, for, from DARPA uh, for developing robotic systems. Didn't know NOAA would do that. So this was a, was a, a real boon to have her help us out uh, uh, making that that possibility available to us. Todd wrote up a an SBIR topic. We competed on it, and I was uh, awarded. Which you know, since I helped seed it, not not you know out of place. Uh, another company did win a uh, phase one contract, but fortunately, I was able to beat them out for the phase two contract as we went along. Um, so when we got the contract, work began in summer of 2016. Worked all year, and in April 2018, I was able to bring the proof of concept rover two out to Gray's Reef for more sea trials. Uh, this is the configuration of that rover: a completely redesigned buoy, a completely redesigned robot. Uh, we now have a stainless steel chassis that will be more dense, so that it's while being hopefully light on the surface, it will um, it will not need to have as much lead added to it to hold it down on the bottom, which was a real problem with that previous robot. The plastic chassis weighed 40 pounds. We had to put 40 pounds of lead on it to hold it down. Uh, so we had an 80 pound robot on the surface, which was which was hard. Uh, we now had a pan tilt. Uh, uh, th now this is the same camera and the same pressure vessel uh, mounted magnetically coupled thrusters uh, or, or motors for the drive chain. Uh, but now we had a pan tilt system and video lights for this for this rover that helped a lot and a completely new uh, design for our buoy we knew we wanted to have the batteries on the surface so we didn't have to the one of the problems with the first rover is that batteries ran we had NICAD batteries at that time they ran for about an hour and then you had to bring the robot up open up pressure ves pressure vessels to swap out batteries no fun so this one has um, a string of uh, eight uh, lead acid batteries for uh, seal lead acid batteries for 96 volts um, inside here, along with a, uh, a, a another Arduino microcontroller, uh, a, an, an Ethernet switch, uh, connections to the um, to the Wi-Fi buoy, and connections down to the to the rover. Uh, you know, again, a a hundred volt uh, Ethernet tether down to the to uh, 100, 100 volt power over Ethernet rover, 
Ethernet uh, tethered down to, to our rover. Um, Folded up very compactly. Um, this is the you know, how this how that uh, that fairly big that that fairly large frame. It's about four feet tall, about five feet wide. Uh, breaks down with eight screws. Um, and as you can see here, as I was mentioning, we we really have to avoid having that uh, that that buoy on the surface drag the rover around. So you can see it's got a very very skinny uh, profile in the water, and uh, subsequently worked very well for that. Uh, this is Captain Todd. Uh, he's our, our, our vessel captain and research diver and, and our technical point of contact for throughout this entire rover project. Um, so this is our deployment day at Gray's Reef and we began uh, actually deploying the rover at, on April 26, 2018. And um, some, you know, you know, this is us on, on deck. There were, I think there were five or six of us on there. I don't have, I've got some other video of them, but uh, not in, this, in these shots. This is just us assembling the, the buoy. And this is the, uh, right here, you can see this is the uh, Wi-Fi transceiver that trans, you know, that it just has a, you know, uh, um, you know uh, UTP ethernet on one side and Wi-Fi on the other. This is all an, 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 a Wi-Fi antenna. Um, so we assemble this, uh, put the tether onto it, and eventually chop the robot over the side. And the way you do it is you just, you just simply lower it by the tether. The camera is pointed straight down, so you can see when you're getting down to the bottom. You turn it on, start watching the camera in the you know the monitor through your computer. Lower it down to the bottom, and when you hit the bottom, you you know at that point you toss the buoy off into the water. So you've got a buoy in the water. Um, you can see, you know, so we got ballast down at the bottom, a nice, you know, light buoy. This is all just PVC pipe, really, really cheap. So it, it, it works really, really well. We can scale it very easily. Uh, keeps the antenna out of the water by a good height. We have a matching antenna on the boat uh, with, a, with an Ethernet wire going right off to our computer. Um, and so this is how it worked. It worked a treat. And as you can see, the fish just are curious about it. I think that's because it's stirring up the sand and maybe presenting them with, with uh, some treats. But driving worked fine. Um, there were a few issues uh, where we would start to skid every now and then, uh, but that was, those were, 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 were minimal and kind of expected. We got that same, that's yeah, that same video again, sorry. Uh, the how are we doing for time on this? I uh, hope we're not doing too badly for time. Um, this is the pan tilt in operation. Uh, it worked very, very well. Uh, our light control worked well. Um, and it was very, very easy to, to maneuver around just with joysticks. You could easily track a fish. This Remember, this is my first time driving this thing down there as well. Uh, it was very easy to just, uh, that fish there, I'm following that perfectly easily with the, with the rover. Now also notice this little six inch blob here. It's a small sponge. And I wanna make note of that because we'll see that in, in closer detail. I don't know why these are doubled up, but I'm uh, sorry about that. This is that sponge with, and, and, and this is the sponge through the camera lens itself. This is what the camera's seeing and recording. Um, we can, when we, when we walk up onto that sponge and zoom in on it, um, this is this is some tiny little thing on the seafloor, but we really get to examine it really, really closely and uh, and in detail. Um, and at this point, we're not even trying to get close up video. We're just trying to see if the camera works. If we're you know, we just want to make sure that, that we don't break something. Uh, but even with that, just easily just cruising around, we're getting really uh -oh. I don't know why these are doubled up. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but we get incredible video out of it. We sneak up on this thing, and now these holes here are maybe, you know, an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch to half inch. Here's a big one that's about a half of an inch, and we're three feet or so away from this thing, but we're still seeing a little brittle star uh, in this little tiny hole, and he's got a little buddy in there. He's got a her little hermit crab in that, in that hole with him. Uh, so we're able to, to observe things in really, really amazing detail and, and pretty sharply. 
Um, and remember, we can we can we can have a minimum focus distance. We can walk the lens right up to to within 30 to to 36 millimeters of those guys and fill the screen with them. Uh, so what does the operator see? This is what you see from the boat. Uh, as I said, it's just an, a, a laptop, and it had a proprietary uh, video link that brought the um, the the HDMI the, the the HDMI output of the camera turned into unfortunately only 640 by 480 uh, NTSC in the in that in that version. But you can still see clearly what's going on. And if you notice, we're just looking at the edge of a of a starfish there or a sea star. Um, you know, this is the this is the more typical view of the of uh, of, of of the video quality that you'd see uh, a couple of divers coming in, and if you also notice, there's just this line of text here. This is your only feedback from what is going on on the bottom. This is the direction the the motors are going, which and and you know between one and and one and zero is going forwards or backwards. Zero to one hundred is is zero to full speed. After a while, you start to be able to read this, but it's it's impossible for anybody new. Now that changes. We 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 finally come up with a with a very nice uh, graphical interface for this later on. Um, so closing in on this, this is you can see we we can see that leg of that sea star, but this is what the camera was actually seeing. And again, we were just cruising around. We just happened to see this the sea star laying there, so I, so I, I zoomed in on him. We're about three feet away, maybe. Um, but, and, and again, not trying to get too close to him, didn't want to scare him, didn't want to run him over, uh, but getting some incredible video uh, just on our, on, our first, on our first tries there. Um, again, you know, we, the, that, that lens has great depth of field and autofocus doesn't get fooled by things in the way. Um, we get down into there where it's easy to see individual grains of sand. And remember, we're 70 feet up and up to a, a kilometer and a half away from this particular piece of kelp. Uh, this, uh, this little segment will really show off this lens uh, and, and this camera. This is a black sea bass. There's millions of them down there. They sort of run that reef. And um, this will give you an idea of the, of the, of the possibilities of that, of that macro lens. and uh, and its capabilities. Um, first of all, notice that you know we've got all this particulate matter flying around in there, and it's not getting full. It's staying focused on the fish. Uh, we're getting close enough where we're seeing individual grains of sand bouncing around on him, um, and he's not afraid. He's just right up to it. But look at the shots we get of his eyes. And again, we're not even particularly trying to get, you know, this was totally happenstance. We weren't trying to get great video of his face. It's just, uh, it, it's easy to do. And, and uh, it's easy enough to do with the system where, where it just kind of happens when you're not even trying for it. But uh, we're really excited about the possibilities that we can get with, uh, with, uh, for doing, you know, macro photography on the bottom. And he's completely unafraid of it. He sat there for this video clip last goes on for about another 30 minutes, well, about 20 minutes. And um, he's just unafraid. He's just sitting there on the bottom and, and looking back at me. Hi, Ed, this is Katie. And I just wanted to give you a five minute warning. Ah, okay, thank you. Um, that's that. So uh, that was our second sea trial. It was a it was a success. We did we did great. We got five hours of video. Uh, really really cool stuff. Um, no failures. Uh, everything worked as anticipated. We learned a little bit about what uh, the the problems with it were, like uh, like slipping in sand and so forth. Uh, then I went back to California to to work on the rover to do another sea trial coming in 2019. And of course, we got COVID, and that stopped, you know, stopped everything everywhere. Um, we got a no-cost extension from NOAA so that we could continue on for another year after the contract, which was supposed to have ended in 2019, in May 2019. Um, I used that to just build a better rover uh, since I was stuck at home. Uh, same thing happened in 2020. Got a second uh, uh, no-cost extension. 
and just continue to improve the reliability of the proof of concept arm until, until we had a pretty solid and reliable arm. So between those times, uh, between here and there, between uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, a bunch of changes uh, got made. We, we built a new aluminum chassis that would, would, would weigh less. That original rover was about 60 pounds, way too heavy. We got down to about 19 kilograms. Uh, which is just a pound or two over our, our weight threshold for a one-person carry. I was able to deploy that myself at the 60 pounds, but it was no fun at all. And we got full 30 frames per second video at the OCU screen instead of the little 64480. Uh, we got a nice graphical uh, display, uh, which I think I've got some video or some, some pictures of, but I'll, if not, I can show it to you later. Uh, we got the camera on a pan and tilt with a 50 centimeter arm, uh, got bogey wheels on there for improved traction, uh, which, which we think will help a lot in the sand. We're looking forward to trying that out. Uh, five minute uh, battery swap uh, with the new buoy. You just pop open a, a, a Pelican case, drop a new battery, or in fact, you don't even do that. You just unplug the Pelican case from the other Pelican case, plug in a new Pelican case, and you're good to go. Um, we uh, have uh, uh, just a, 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 a much more modularized robot. They're now separate ethernet entities. You can buy the camera and just run it as ethernet, stick it in the sand and, and, and talk to it if you've got something like that's a Cecil animal, like uh, an anemone that you wanna look or that you wanna look at. Then you can buy an arm, then you can buy a tractor as, as, as things go on. Um, we are closer to, to uh, commercialization, but we want to go through our, we want to do that last NOAA C trial to see, uh, you know, anything we want, might want to change. Uh, I'm going to skip it. Now, it's, it's an easy to use system. After two days of watching me do it, Todd Resikar and Mary Beth Head, his assistant, were able to just take the Grover out to the reef on their own, deploy it, and get some great video. Um, See, uh, so who are our potential clients for this? NOAA, of course, the original idea was to, to was to see how many other marine sanctuaries um, might be interested in this system. Some of them it won't be appropriate for where there's just live coral everywhere. We never want to put this down on live coral. It'd be like Godzilla in Tokyo. Uh, we don't want to do that. But there are a lot of uh, places like uh, Stellwagen Banks where it's still flat sand. Uh, and 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 uh, and a great environment to run a, a robot on and look at the benthic organisms that live there. Uh, we have some military ties, both with some current clients of ours and uh, from my history at iRobot in their military industrial division doing their explosive ordnance disposal robots. Um, you know, students in underwater robotics, like the mate competition uh, people, I think that we have some really good tools for those folks, and we're looking forward to commercializing uh, the the set of tools by which I built this rover to 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 um, make available to them as well. Um, basically, anybody who sits on the edge of the water with a kid and wonders what's down there, we Robonautica's, Robonautica's got some tools for you. Um, other applications. This is one that I'm I'm hoping that that, that might be a, a great uh, uh, combination for a combined set of research. This is a metabolic uh, sensor for analyzing uh, coral reefs uh, designed by Dr. Alina Schmont at University of North Carolina. Um, you plug this down onto a, onto a, a coral reef with a soft cup and it it analyzes the metabolic gases that come off the reef and give you an indication of the health of the of the metabolism of the coral. Um, it's diver deployed, takes about 15 minutes, so it takes uh, a long time. If you're 70 feet down, you get three or four samples before you've got to come up. Uh, it would be great to develop that as a payload for our bottom crawling rover, uh, and and that way they could do you know get uh, you know much greatly greatly increased sample fre uh, sample frequency and, and number of samples per trip. Um, Stellwagen banks is another environment that's deep, has a, a, a very, very important little fish that lives down in the benthos. They burrow in the sand. Uh, sand lances are an important species of prey for humpback whales. And fluctuations in sand lance numbers give you a good predictor of, of, the, of the populations that you can expect of their big predators, like, like humpback whales. So there's a lot of research that goes over uh, that, that happens for those. Um, we hope that, um, you know, the, 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 the reef rover is modular enough where 
I think I can build one of those that scales up to the 200 foot depths that will get a large set of cameras down there for a, a, a rover that could live down in the sand with those guys and follow around with a, with a, for a persistent presence robot. Um, additional applications, that rover uh, has big flat wide tracks. It works great on soft mud. Um, you know, for studying things like eelgrass, the bay I happen to live on, if you walk out into it, uh, you sink right down up to your, up to your hips. Uh, similar in Gray's Reef or, or, or along the shore of Savannah, Georgia, um, Kathy Zakas will tell you that you, could, you can have a lot of fun walking out onto that and you'll be hip deep in mud in no time flat. Uh, commercial benthic aquaculture, I think there's some applications there for monitoring seabeds. And I think that there's a, a, a good shot at lionfish remediation from a, a bottom crawling platform. Since they don't go anywhere, you can walk up to them and shoot them or capture them. And I think we have some, you know, there's, there's I, I did a lionfish uh, remediation project uh, for a volunteer or for a nonprofit before. And I think there's some, some applications there. So what's next for, Groves, for the Grover? Uh, we're gonna prepare for our sea trials in summer. Uh, we need to complete those to, um, you know, to, to that prototype one evaluation to drive prototype two designs, get it commercially ready. We don't want to build a bunch of rovers before we get that last uh, set of, of, um, uh, of evaluations uh, to, to make note of any changes we want to make. Uh, we've been breaking these, these components out, and, and I, I've got more pictures that I can get into in the, in the question and answer section. If you want to you, you know, I, I, I apologize for the dearth of uh, pictures of the robot. Um, but, um, and of course, we'll be pursuing funding for, proto, for the prototype two improvements and uh, getting ready to, to manufacture our first batch of five rovers for other marine sanctuaries and other, other commercial customers. Um, we've also got some Tang. We got some spin-off products from this, uh, sealed brushless DC motors um, that, that are good to 200 feet. Uh, that are that uh, house uh, regular commercial um, motors that that are are drone ready, so you can easily just swap in uh, motors of different size and different properties. If you want a, a fast low torque motor versus a slower high torque motor, uh, you don't have to build another underwater motor. You can just put it in this housing, and it's magnetically coupled, so it's completely sealed uh, from the from the from the water environment. No seals to fix. Uh, um, you know, we've uh, for all of, for the for sensing the position of uh, the the arm and pan tilt, we did some very nice little underwater magnetic rotary sensors. Uh, I think those would be generally useful to anybody who's um, who's doing underwater robotics. Uh, the house Sony camera with an Ethernet inter interface. Um, I think that, that will 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 be a great tool for anybody who's just wanting to observe uh, underwater. Um, with a with a with a with a very powerful uh, camera system that you can control from the surface, uh, upload and download video. Um, and that's pretty much the same thing I just said. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, we're 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 hoping to talk to people and find out what Robonauta can do for you. This started out as just a hey, you got a crazy idea? What can we do to to help you make it real? And uh, we've we've we, we've gotten there for that and we'd love to see um, who else has got something that they just need and they ha just haven't been able to find or they think is crazy and can't be done or uh, just can't quite find the robotic product that that meets their needs and you know price or 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 capabilities um, so uh, that's the end of the formal presentation thank you all for uh, for attending and I just wanted to thank uh, Everybody at Gray's Reef, past and present, Todd Resikar, of course, the man, Sarah Fangman, who uh, was the superintendent that would not have gotten this off the ground, Jody Patterson, who uh, was also at Gray's Reef, who was at, at, at every phase of, of this, of the development of this, she's been, been there uh, with hands on. Kathy Zakas, she's the queen. I, I wouldn't know anybody out there without having first met her, and she's, uh, you know, she's a force of nature. Uh, Mary Beth Head, who did a lot of the video uh, of the of the robot and helped with the with the uh, robot wrangling. Justin Maiano, who took over from uh, from Todd Resikar as the no appointed contact for the project. Uh, Michelle Riley, who's who's been great helping out with uh, media 
uh, you know, you know, helping me uh, do do photographic processing and and getting this meet, you know, getting our video output media ready. Stan Rogers, who is the current head, who um, we'll be working with a lot more uh, in the fall, I hope. Scott Cathy, who was the superintendent when we did our our last batch, who was out on the boat with us that day. Uh, super volunteer, diver Randy Rudd, who's been a NOAA volunteer at Grace Reef for a long time. Couldn't have done it without him. He, uh, you know, he's, you know, he, he's, you know, I can't say enough about the guy. He, he just, you know, extends himself and, uh, and, and you know, they, they probably can't run Grays Reef Sanctuary without him. Uh, Gabriel Mathias, who was at the Skidaway Oceanographic Institute, Jody Patterson, of course, uh, and Sarah Fangman, thanks for the extra for the video. And thank you all for attending. And I think that's it. So um, I can take any questions you have. And I'll also try and get up a uh, video uh, or, or another presentation of um, that has some, some more photographs of the rover. Again, I apologize for not having more of those in this. Hi, Ed. Awesome. Great presentation. Um, it was it was awesome. Uh, we do have a hard stop at the hour, so we've got about nine minutes, and I'm going to grab what questions we do have. So our first question is, how low can the underwater visibility be based on underwater conditions, uh, for example, silting? Um, how well, how long can this um, instrument platform operate? Also, are there any potential use uh, at night with lights? Yes. Uh, it First of all, it does have video lights on it. Uh, we modified some commercially available video lights that uh, the, the NOAA divers love, which were, I think it's called, the company's called Light in Motion. Um, and they use them for their their video lights for doing photography. Uh, I modified those so they're they're computer controllable, and those you'll see on the top of the robot. Um, how silty can it get? As silty as it can possibly get. Uh, there's there's no limit to the lack of visibility you can have underwater uh, if it gets silty enough uh, in the right conditions. I've been in water as a diver where you literally could not see your hand in front of your face. That's probably not going to happen at Grace Reef. You were seeing it. It's it's got a lot of silty uh, of of material in the water, so it's kind of cloudy water. But that's kind of how it is out there. But um, if if the water is silted up, that's just it. You can't see through it, and neither can a camera. So if you were in a cave system, for instance, using this, and somebody kicked the fin and the cave silts up, you know, nobody's going to see anything because um, you, you 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 simply can't see through particulate matter. In the water, and in fact, we had some some places uh, that we were testing um, at Gray's Reef where, and I don't think we, you know, Todd may know we we I don't think we ever underst understood it or explained it, but it was just full of silty, cloudy material that uh, we just couldn't see through, just this black particulate matter that we think was uh, uh, runoff from from rivers, uh, just bits of leaf and and that kind of detritus, but uh, but uh, pretty hard to see through. Um, there was another part of that question, I think, I'm, I, that I probably blew blew past. <laughs> no, that's okay. I think you answered it. So we have a follow up to that. Um, for nighttime ob observations capabilities, can observations be made without white light, um, without white lights like infrared? Yes. Um, yeah, a lot of cameras do that, and in fact, that Sony camera is very sensitive to infrared. Uh, you can put filters on it to enhance that. You can put filters on it to reduce that. Um, right, right off the bat, you, you notice that the entire color of the water there is green. You can put filters there that filter out the that green and give you a little bit more uh, natural natural light uh, as that that's there. In fact, that's one of the reasons why divers use uh, use lights when you shine an actual light source that you have local on the subject. Then you get it in its true colors. But the only light that penetrates are from the surface from the sun are the long wavelengths, blue, which is why you know, deep water is always blue. Uh, next, green. Uh, you know, then then yellow. The reds are the first thing to get filtered out at the at the top of the water. Um, so yeah, we could easily um, do. We could do infrared photography uh, with that system. Um, but really, if you just have visible and you know, visible light works fine. But if you wanted to say photograph an animal that was sensitive to visible light and didn't come out, like you, there was an octopus or something that you wanted to find out when did he come out and hunt at night. Uh, and he doesn't like visible light, you could, in fact, go to infrared and, and do that. I believe, I, I'm not, I haven't done that, so I don't wanna, don't wanna swear, but I, I'm pretty sure that that is the case. Great, Ed. Uh, our next question, 
Uh, who should uh, someone contact to obtain a copy of the build documents that will be made available to NOAA? Uh, NOAA. Um, so somebody at Gray's Reef, I presume. Let me let me think about this for a sec. You could contact me, but te technically those will be um, the documents that I give to NOAA will be NOAA property, and they will do with them as they see fit. Generally, if it's a NOAA, if it's something NOAA, NOAA loves making things public because they want they want you to be smarter. Um, if if it's something that I have um, that is has access to NOAA, uh, come talk to me. And if it's something where I think that they need to be involved in it, I would I would certainly defer to to what. Um, uh, you know, either, you know, Stan Rogers or whoever winds up being responsible for this project at, at NOAA. Justin Mayano is the technical point of contact. Well, he was until the contract ended, but right now, now that the contract is, it has ended, it's sort of an orphan. So um, it, it's an open question, but uh, we, we can certainly answer that for you when it, when it comes up. Great, thanks. We did have uh, someone chime in in the in the question panel here that says um, if they would like to reach out to them, they can let them know how to get hold of those contact um, that those documents, um, and that would be in the future. And that is uh, Michelle Riley, and I can put yes. her uh, her contact information in the chat for everyone. So yes. our next question, since we're close to time, camera rotation is 270 degrees. Is there a second camera facing aft to watch the back door for reverse operation, et cetera? Uh, there is not now, but we could. Um, as I said, that camera is just an Ethernet camera. Um, there's there on board the robot is a five-port Ethernet switch with power over Ethernet. So we can plug another camera into that if we wanted to, and it would be just another streaming camera going up to the surface. The software we use to, to do the streaming, by the way, both on the Raspberry Pi that's on the camera and on the surface is GStreamer, which is an open source extremely powerful extremely popular uh video streaming uh, uh application so yeah we can we can if if we wanted to add two more cameras we could do that one pointed straight down so you could see sort of the overhead view of the rover to, to help avoid obstacles would be a good thing um and if you wanted more cameras we could just we could just simply add another ethernet switch and you can just keep plugging cameras in until you you know as long as you want to so yeah, we can we can make more in interfaces for both USB cameras. Uh, yeah, Ethernet cameras are are easy. Just just plug it into the Ethernet port and and get power, and we could just simply do that. Thanks, Ed. Okay, one last question, um, mm -hmm. and this one was from uh, Tiffany earlier today. What are you looking for before uh, this is released to commercialization next fall? What am I looking for? Um, the well the first thing that has to happen is it doesn't have to happen but we'd like it to happen um when we did our contract before covid knocked us out of the game the idea was we were going to come back out with this after the second rover it's going to you know we we, we did a we did a, a dive a set of dives in 2018 came back did a bunch of work added uh bogey wheels to the tracks to, to help the traction uh you know improve the the you know the ocu did a whole bunch of stuff uh wanted to come back out there and do another set of sea trials and and get another set of uh, evaluations and then use that to build uh the, the 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 final prototype before we say okay now let's make this the thing that we try and and actually commercialize um unfortunately the contract ended before that happened but uh you know, my understanding is that, uh, you know, I've talked to Stan Rogers a few times and they would like for me to come out there uh, and, and uh, you know, either spring or over summer. And we have a, you know, there's some some events that are going to happen in, 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 in the autumn. That would be a great time to come out there. We'd like to come out there and do those uh, do those sea trials and get that before we do our last set of, of, um, of developments. Another thing we would like to have is some funding to, to make that happen. Um, you know, we're now two years out in the wind, uh, you know, past where we were we were hoping to be with funding uh, to build that five that that set of five robots that would help generate income. We hope by being able to present those to um, uh, potential users for evaluation and hopefully some sales. Um, you know, some sources of funding on that would be would be wonderful. So, <laughs> um, so those are two. Awesome, things. Ed. 
Yep. Thank you. We are sorry. I sorry to interrupt you there. We are at our one o'clock hour, and I wanted to um, say out loud what a fantastic presentation this was, and um, that there are definitely some people who would like to reach out to you. Do you want to flash to your last slide really quickly so we can uh, yeah. reiterate your email address? Sorry. Yes. Uh, let's see now. Uh, yep. Here we go. Um, awesome. Thank you, everyone. Take a screenshot. Um, if you did have a question that we didn't get to, please reach out to ed at ed.williams at robonautica.com. And if we, if you put a question in the question panel that we didn't answer, I will be passing those on to Ed at the end. I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Ed, again, for a wonderful presentation. I hope everyone has a safe and healthy rest of their Wednesday. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Katie and uh, Tiffany. Uh, this has been this has been great. I was pretty nervous about doing it, but it's 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 gone fine. And and thank you so much for putting these on. I really enjoyed the the rest of the series. Uh, I've been going through those videos, and they're all they're all really wonderful. So it's it's an amazing program. So thanks for for keeping it running. Thank you all. Good day. Good day.